depending on from where you are joining us. I am Nata Devuri, and I'm the head of discipline, the gender and women's studies discipline. It is my pleasure to welcome you to this seminar, our International Women's Days Seminar. This seminar is extremely relevant in the current context of the events that are taking place in Ukraine and the flow of humanity seeking refuge that we see on a daily basis. What the events in Ukraine tell us and have reinforced is that no one is born a refugee. One becomes or is forced to become a refugee given circumstances that are beyond one's control. The journey of refugee is an unwanted one. It is painful and it often is uncertain in terms of the final outcome. What we're also seeing in the last two weeks is that it is highly racialized. While Ukrainians are being welcomed with open arms, by countries that have often turned a cold shoulder to those who are considered other, those black and brown persons who are often the other. Today's seminar is going to be actually exploring some of the hurdles and obstacles that asylum seekers who are other often face. And by examining these obstacles and hurdles and the lack of services, this seminar is hoping to bring them from the margins to the center to ensure gender equality today. And that is the only way that we can ensure sustainability tomorrow, which is the theme of this year's International Women's Day. I now turn it over to Dr. Stacy Scriver, director of our MA Gender Globalization and Rights to moderate the rest of the session. Stacy, Thank you, Nata. Um, we're delighted to be here and we have a, a group of students with me as well who will be listening in. Um, so what I'll be doing now is doing introduction to our three speakers and we'll then hand it over to them. We are delighted to be able to welcome Professor Jane Freedom of the University of Paris 8, who is leading the French team of this project, as well as is the international coordinator. Professor Friedman's work and research focuses on issues of gender and migration, and her recent publications include Gendering the International Asylum and Refugee Debate, and a gendered approach to the Syrian refugee crisis. Professor Freedom Friedman will be talking after me to give an overview of the project. This will be followed by Dr. Nazrin Pandokar, a postdoctoral researcher on this project and associate professor in anthropology at the Jahan Ganangar University. Dr. Pandokar has written articles on issues such as the critique of identity politics in relation to trans and hijra community in South Asia, critiquing the idea of women empowerment and development discourse and the consumerist aggression on the female body. Her research interests include gender and sexuality, sexual subaltern, emotion and affect, post-colonial critiques, nationalism, identity politics, intersectionality, and subjectivities. Dr. Kandoker will be discussing the findings from the Irish aspect of this study. We'll then be hearing from Dr. Nina Sahuri, a postdoctoral researcher at the Paris Center for Sociological and Political Research, who will share the findings from the French aspect of the study. Dr. Sarui is Miri Sklandowski Curry, postdoctoral fellow at the Paris Center for Sociological and Political Research. Her recent publications include the monograph Racialized Workers in European Older Age Care, From Care Labor to Care Ethics, and the edited volume Border Across Healthcare, Moral Economies of Healthcare and Migration in Europe. We are delighted to have these three speakers with us today to mark International Women's Day and to share the findings of the working study, which Professor Friedman is discussing in more detail. So I will hand it over to her. Thank you very much uh, for the introduction, Stacey, and thank you very much for this invitation, and Nata, thank you very much for this invitation to discuss our, the results of our research project, at least the results from two of the countries involved in the project. So I just wanted to give a very, very brief introduction um, to explain the, what the project is, 
and the context of these two um, country studies, which uh, will be presented today by uh, Nasreen and by Nina. Um, our project is um, an international project, which is funded by the European Union's GenderNet Plus funding scheme involving, and we have teams in seven countries, both in Europe, but also we have um, a team in Canada. And the idea of the projects is to look at gender-based violence in the context of migration, and specifically gender-based violence against migrant women and refugees. I say refugees, migrants and refugees here, because we want to try within the project to break uh -huh. down as well the very strict categorizations that they exist um, in policy or in research between migrants and refugees and to insist that these women who are displaced who are in movement face specific challenges so the idea of the project is to understand what are the structural and systematic factors which might render these women vulnerable to um, experiencing gender-based violence and what services also are available for them when they're the victims of gender-based violence, both on their journeys and when they arrive um, in a host country. And we're looking at this within uh, an intersectional framework. As Nata said at the beginning, we've seen the uh, Ukraine crisis at the moment is illustrating the way in which uh, refugee reception is very highly racialized and um, where people will be considered and treated differently, uh, not only because of their gender, um, identity, but also because of their race, ethnicity, their national origin, their sexual or orientation, their age, their ability or disability. So we're trying to take into account these intersectional factors to understand how and why um, women experience um, gender-based violence. Um, and as well, I think uh, Nasreen and uh, Nina are going to give um, some very, some more uh, concrete examples um, based on the findings from our, from our country studies. But just to um, give some broad overview of what we found across all of the countries um, from our research so far. Um, often, uh, it seems problematic that gender-based violence in the context of migration is talked about in very culturalist terms. So we found by analyzing political discourse or media discourse in many of the countries, that in, when we talk about migrants and refugees and gender-based violence. Um, often there's a focus on forms of violence such as um, forced marriage or female genital mutilation, which are associated with these other cultures and other women. And that this focus can in fact deflect attention from the more widespread and more um, basic structural and systematic features which make migrant and refugee women vulnerable to all types of gender-based violence and not just these very specific and very culturalist, um, very cultural, culturalist representations of violence, which we see. Um, another finding which, which we've has come across strongly is the, the continuum of violence which women experience. So a continuum both in terms of geographical continuum, so that they may well have experienced violence in their country of origin. This might certainly be um, at the root of their decision um, to, to migrate. But that this violence then persists through their migration journeys and once they arrive um, in a country of destination. And as the research both in Ireland um, and in France has shown, in which we're going to speak about in more detail later, the um, reception conditions um, for refugees in these countries of destination reception conditions which are often inadequate and which could actually be seen as conditions of neglect, also contribute to creating situa situations of vulnerability to violence and in actually uh, exercising forms of symbolic violence uh, against uh, these women who arrive. So we're looking at this violence um, not as individual or isolated events, but as a continuum which, which, um, which occurs across migrant journeys and a continuum which is based in forms of intersectional inequalities um, within um, and which is strongly influenced by migrant and refugee policies in countries of transit but also in countries of destination. So I think I won't say any more 
generally here because it will be I don't want to take up too much time um, and I would like to hand over to the two speakers or perhaps back to Stacey but then over to Nasreen and Tanina who are going to speak speak some more about the um, specific results of the research uh, in Ireland and also in France so thank you very much. Thank you very much, Jane. And we could now have Nazrin to tell us a little bit more about the Irish study. Thank you. Uh, just let me share my screen. Uh, uh, thank you so much, uh, Nate, uh, Nata, Stacey, and Jen, uh, for this uh, wonderful opportunity to present our research findings to mark uh, International Women's Day in the discipline of gender and women's studies. Um, today, I will present some of the, our empirical findings of the research we are doing in the Irish context. Uh, the Irish research team found that the vulnerability is created by many forms of structural inequality, often um, make it challenging to see migrant women's perspectives uh, and their sufferings and the paths of resilience available to take or create. So before going um, into the detail, um, of uh, into the research findings, I first want to talk a little about three important contexts of migration in Ireland. The first one is the migration patterns. Um, historically, Ireland is EU is one of the least developed countries and it had mostly outward migration. Things started to change in the year of Celtic Tiger when Ireland became a country of net inward migration for the first time. According to the 2016 Irish census, Polish and uh, British nationals were the largest communities of non-Irish nationals. Within that inward migration flow, uh, small subsets of migrants coming from Ireland, uh, coming to Ireland for international protections. From a few hundred uh, uh, IP applications in 1994 raised to almost 12,000 by 2002. For the applicants, the direct provision system was uh, established in 2000 and uh, IP applications started to decline from 2002. And it declined even more in the time of financial crisis from 2008 to 2013. In 2004, uh, the citizenship referendum uh, changed the constitutional rights of every child born in Ireland to be the citizen of the state. And by 2019, while uh, 740,000 applications for IP lodged in EU, uh, Ireland only received 0.6% uh, amongst those applications, which is 4,784. In addition to IP applicants, Irish Refuge, uh, Refugee Protection uh, Program, which is established in 2015, committed to accepting 4,000 refugees via relocation and resettlement schemes. And the second context is the hierarchy of immigration statuses, uh, which is crucial to have access to gender-based violence supports and services for non-IP and non-EEA nationals. STAM, two, uh, STAM zero uh, is uh, for those who demonstrate complete self-sufficiency of themselves and their dependents. They don't have the right to work in the state. STAMP one also has some sub uh, subsections, which is complicated, but it may lead the spouse partners or dependents of certain employment permit holders of, or recent graduates. STAMP two is for the full-time students uh, who are permitted to work half-time during terms and full-time otherwise and they cannot receive any state benefits or services. STAM tree is for the dependents of non-EEA employment permit holders. STAM tree holders are not permitted to work. STAM four gives almost similar entitlement with Irish citizen. It is usually gives, given to non-EEA spouses, partners, or dependents of Irish citizens, and uh, high skill or critical skill employment and to the people granted international protections. STEM four, five and six are the naturalized and dual citizens in, in indicating permission to stay without conditions. For undocumented uh, non-EEA migrants who usually loses uh, their um, legal status due to the death, divorce, departure, or a sponsoring spouse, recently an application for permission to stay can be made to Minister for Justice and uh, granted at their discretion. All stamp holders from zero to four experiences additional difficulties comparing to Irish citizen in assessing gender-based violence supports, especially refuse uh, accommodation, which is tied to a habitual residence requirement. 
Um, and the third context is Ireland's system of direct provision. Uh, it is a system to which Irish state meets its obligations to provide for material needs of people seeking international protection. Most applicants spend minimum three plus years in the systems. Um, they are excluded from most social welfare entitlement. Although from last year, they can access free fees in higher education. They are provided basic bed and board with common eating areas. They have little or no control over food provided. They have to use shared bedrooms and bathroom facilities and small weekly allowances of 29 euro and 80 cents per child and 38 euro 80 cents per adult was given to them. They had to wait six months to access labor market, which was reduced from nine months in 2021. Children have access to primary secondary education uh, on the same basis of Irish citizens. They also have access to, uh, to free public health care through medical cards. About 80% of all protection applications um, applicants reside in um, direct provision centers, and most of the uh, DP centers are managed by private entrepreneurs. So in this migration context, to understand gender-based violence, our main method of data collection was semi-structured interview and a short questionnaire to get the background information of the participants. We selected the participants for the category of migrant women, but the variety within them is really wide. So we took the migrant constituent for those who came to Ireland from other countries. For women, we take the individuals who identify themselves as women. Excuse me. <coughs> Excuse me. To get the participants, we mostly invited people from different social media pages, mainly to Facebook and Twitter. We also tried to have them to the service providers. We also put some posters in some of the graduate stations to invite participants. Um, it is to be noted that the research topic is very sensitive and getting participants to talk about this is very hard. In addition to that, because of the pandemic, it became even more challenging. Still, we are pretty satisfied that although the number of participants is not to mark our expectations, the data we have uh, got from them is significant. For the semi-structured interview, our focus wasn't on what happened to them. Instead, we wanted to know about their observations, opinion, and perception about migration and gender-based violence from their experiences. We wanted to know their suggestions um, that can bring changes to prevent the threats and vulnerabilities caused by many factors regarding gender-based violence and migration. But the questionnaire, we ask them for the information that can situate them uh, to their socio-cultural and political context to understand the relations between their experience and their legal, political, economic, and relational status. Um, sorry, excuse me. Um, here is some data showing the regional distribution from where the migrant participants came from or the places they feel they used to belong. It shows that we managed to cover a relatively large number of locations around the world. Um, we have participants roughly from Southern North and Middle Africa, South Asia, East Asia, South America, Eastern Europe, and Russia. Um, here are some other data to show the legal, social, and financial situation of the participants. For marital status, uh, here we see that all, almost one third of, are the single, uh, but to be noted that few participants are divorced, but they prefer to identify them as single. Some people are in the process of separating and some are already li uh, living separate. More than half of the participants belong to the 30 to 40 years for the age group, and for the rest, uh, four of them are in their 20s, three are in their 30s, and only two are in their 50s. One of the most critical pieces of information here is the legal status of the state. Um, the majority of them are um, international protection applicants, but we also have many uh, comparatively privileged migration statuses, such as having an Irish or EU passport or stamp for. Here we can also see that we have women from much different housing situations. Most of them are renting either a whole house or a room in a shared house. Five of them live in uh, DP centers. Uh, five of them manage to have their own home with a mortgage, which is also shared with their partners. And then the rest of them have accommodation support from the social housing. However, two of my participants lived uh, as homeless at some point in this country. 
to understand the risk, vulnerability, resilience, and resistance of the migrant women who participated in this research, we examined the concept of intersectionality. Although the term intersectionality has coined by Kimberly Crenshaw, it has been rooted in the Black and post-colonial feminist critics of white feminism singles issue-centric position. Intersectionality is an idea developed by the understanding that women as a political category cannot be separated from many other forms of power relations, for example, racism, Eurocentrism, and class struggle. In our research, we tried to understand the intersectionality of migrant women, but it became clear for us that to get the support from the service providers, which are mostly organized either for migrants or for women, Migrant women often struggle to fit into both of these categories and remain marginalized and alienated. In this context, uh, to be aware of the risk of essentializing presupposition to define migrant women, we find that the idea of situating intersectionality proposed by Mira Goval Davis is the most useful conceptual frame. Influenced by feminist standpoint theory and situated knowledge, Yuval Davis explains this situated intersectionality with four kinds of macro domains that are important in understanding social inequalities. The first domain relates to the borders of state from local to national to supra and international. State and non-state competing political actors can crucially affect the quality of the life and the resources available to those living within those boundaries. The second domain relates to the boundaries of the multi-scalar zones in which different economic, social, cultural, and political resources are produced, reproduced, and distributed. The third domain relates to the boundaries constructed by different kinds of political projects of belonging, such as nationalism, racism, religion, cosmopolitanism, and much more. The fourth domain relates to the boundaries of intergenerational, familial, and informal communities and networks aimed at social, biological, and symbolic reproduction. To apply th this idea of situated intersectionality in our research, we added three forms of micro-level sites that shapes possible modes of agency, resilience, and resistance. And these are, first one is a person's positioning along social economic grids of power influenced by access or lack of access to resources of different types. Second is a person's experiences and sense of identity and belonging. Third, the value systems and normative ideas occupied or held by them. We are still developing these micro perspectives, and, but today I will mostly talk about uh, the mac macro domains that Uval Davis suggested. But the first domain, uh, nation state and their bodies inside and outside influence the very being of migrant women. I, here I am presenting some of the quotes from our research. And the first quote is from Rachel is 30 plus. Um, the names are all pseudonames. Um, um, uh, she's single, Rachel is single, undocumented. Uh, she was undocumented before and from Brazil. Uh, here she says that, well, when you don't have a visa, you don't have access to anything. Uh, so uh, at this, uh, that's our quote. So you are basically the person who should not exist in the first place. You can't claim any rights. Um, second quote is for Helena. Uh, she's a 30 uh, plus uh, single. She's an asylum seeker from South Africa. She was trying to say in this quote that despite gender-based violence is a universal thing, when someone is coming through the international protection process and with very little money, gender-based violence feels very different. Uzma um, is uh, 30 plus, uh, she's married, came from Tunisia. She was telling her experience of having stamp tree. She was saying that, uh, quotation, it's not fair that in 2021, what we are experiencing when you have stamp tree. Well, put end. Um, it's basically you were told by the service providers that you can't stay in, in a safe house more than two weeks. You have to go back to your health. You need to experience abuse. Um, Elena, age 30 uh, plus, asylum seeker, single from Swaziland. She was saying that a lot of women uh, keep quiet because they do not want that these uh, migrant men compromised if, if they are abused by um, migrant men. And they keep quiet at the expenses of their own safety. Banu, age uh, 30 plus, uh, separated, uh, having a stand for. Uh, she is from Pakistan. She said that she can't visit her mother 
because if she gets, uh, goes to Pakistan, her husband will take uh, her kids from her. It became very clear to this expression, the way state and its border create and maintain inequality and determines how the women experience gender-based violence. The second domain is economic, political, cultural, and politi um, social cultural and political production and distributions. And the first quote is for Elena, who is an um, applicant of international protection, came from Swaziland. She was saying that the money she was given while waiting for her application to process, how little it is. If I wanna, uh, it's quotation, if I wanna get clothes for myself or for my child, it has to happen within that 68 euro. That's around 250 for a month. Me and my baby, our whole life has to revolve around this. Second quote is for Pia. Um, she is a 35 married from Pakistan. She has an Irish passport. Despite the fact that she was a certified homeopathic doctor, she couldn't manage to continue her career here according to her expertise. Rather, she had to start from scratch to fit in for the Irish job market. Uzma from Tunisia, she was saying about the lack of childcare facilities. Uh, she was saying childcare for women is like they cut your wings here. Joya came from Bangladesh. She's married and have an Irish passport. She was saying, how did she feel after coming here? She was an independent working woman, but after coming here, because she had a stem tree, she had to be dependent on her abuser husband. She was saying, I was working in Bangladesh. I had a good job for seven or eight years. So when I came here, I didn't have a job. I didn't have a work permit. I was completely dependent on my husband. It's clear with these quotes that the economic, social, cultural, and political resources and their distribution deeply affect the life of migrant women and creates vulnerability. The third domain is the political projects of belonging. We see Selena, she was saying she, she's a um, 30 plus married. She is also a asylum seeker from South Africa. She was saying, quote, we haven't gone for a, to a mosque and this Ramadan is very hard. It is hard. She cannot belong here. She feels that. Irina uh, is 30 plus single asylum seeker from South Africa. She was saying that it can be really lonely. You can have friends, you can have people, but you miss the part of you that you grew up with. Kaya from Sudan, she's single, is 40 plus. Uh, she have an Irish passport. She was saying, when you are wearing a hijab here, uh, hijab is a lot of questioning, even if you are an Irish. I decided to take it off just because I am going through a lot of stuff and I can't put more pressure on you. Helena from South Africa is 30 plus, single, and she is also an asylum seeker. She was saying, quote, how do you integrate into society when you have lived so long in direct provision? I'm still trying to figure th that out. You need to feel like a part of the community. That's uh, quote, finish quote. That's what the system does to someone. She was saying, and they create a feeling of non-belonging. But there are also positive initiatives from the migrant women to create a place here for them. Daisy from Zimbabwe is 40 plus, divorced, she is also an asylum seeker. She said that she started a project called Online Friendship Project and where they connect one asylum seeker to an Irish citizen and they exchange culture. Through these quotes, we can see how political project of belonging is one of the central issue that creates inequality in the lives of migrant women. But at the same time, we can see the agency resilience and to some extent resistance to that. The fourth domain is intergenerational, familiar, and informal communities. Here is a quote from Irina uh, from South Africa. Uh, she was saying that, I have never seen my family for five years. Yeah, so it has only been me and my son. And after everything, when the sun sets and everything that happens, I feel that void, that emptiness. Quotation finish. Joya from Bangladesh was saying, I was alienated from my family and here I couldn't understand people here. Their way of being, communicating, you know, when you are uprooted from a familiar situation to somewhere that is totally unknown with financial shock, with a small kid, it was really difficult, quote end. Kaya from Sudan was saying how she has been disowned by her family. 
um, because of that she, uh, the, the, the situation that she'd been through uh, of gender-based violence. But after my, she was saying, but after my experience with my family, if I can't change my family member to accept me, I'm going to tell you, there will never be any way for the community or other countries to accept us. Pia from Pakistan was saying, inclusion and diversity should begin from top to bottom, not just including foreigners into their student category. Their staff should be inclusive as well, you know, so they could teach their children respect about other culture, other people, quote end. We can see that being able to build in community, having family supports are crucial for the victims of gender-based violence. And by these codes, we can see how does it affects the lives of migrant women. Through these four domains of inequality, we can see that the identities based on race, gender, or class are not constant. On the contrary, they can be very different in a different situation interlinked with other factors. In addition to that, these factors constantly restructure the identities. We can also see that gender-based violence is scattered around these domains. This is because they are so profoundly connected to the situation that the women leave. Also, the data shows that the violence, whether structural or gender-based, is continuing. It doesn't stop with one experience. Therefore, we call it a continuum of violence. Lastly, our research shows that within these constraints and continuum of violence, women constantly try to find ways to survive. It shows the power of resilience and the possibilities of resistance within these domains that maintain inequality and violence. Thank you very much. I'll end up here. Thank you very much, Nazrin, for that presentation. So we will now turn over to Nina, who will tell us about the French aspect of the study. And just to all in the audience, just to note that you can add your questions to the chat and we will have time after the presentations to discuss these further. So Nina, we'll invite you to the stage. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much for, for this invitation to present our results today. I'm, I'm very happy we have this opportunity. So um, I will be presenting some results from uh, the study that we have been conducted, conducting with Jen Friedman and also uh, for a specific part of the study, also with another colleague, Elsa Tischler, uh, in our research unit. So this is based on qualitative research that we have been carrying out uh, in the Paris region in, in 2019 and 2020. Uh, meeting many NGOs and also uh, spending time in a reception center for asylum seeking women and families. And this center was set up at the request of the Paris City Council. It opened in January 2017 in the context of public pressure to act to provide suitable accommodation specifically for women asylum seekers. And this center, which is now run by uh, a big NGO called Emmaüs Solidarité, with also the support from another NGO, Semi Social, for its health services. Uh, so this center houses now around 400 asylum seekers for temporary stays until they are relocated to other centers across uh, France. And it's important uh, to mention that this center has been promoted by the Paris City Council as an example of excellence in the reception of asylum seekers. So even though there are limitations and shortcomings, um, we need to keep in mind to keep in mind that this this center was really uh, unique in, uh, in 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 the landscape of uh, of accommodation centers in France. So we carried out interviews with different health uh, care workers, doctors, nurses, psychologists, also interpreters, and also with women asylum seekers themselves to explore their stories and their experiences of seeking protection in France. We interviewed 14 women and have also spent time with them in other settings, for example, a workshop that we organized in collaboration with the center on when we accompanied this woman on different medical appointments uh, in, across the city of Paris. And all of the women who we interviewed for this research had made an asylum claim uh, in France, and many of them were uh, pregnant at that moment or had been pregnant or given birth during uh, their journey to France. 
Having arrived in France, the women we met said they thought they would find protection from the multiple forms of violence that they experienced in their country of origin and on the migratory journeys. But our research revealed the continuum of violence, uh, as has been mentioned before, this was also a concept that was very useful for us. Uh, so this continuum of violence also extended to the reception uh, context in France, where failure to provide adequate accommodation and access to services can be understood, we would argue, as deliberate indifference or forms of institutional abandonment or degradation uh, by design to use a Canning's um, expression. And this created and reinforced gendered vulnerabilities to violence that can be considered as a form of violence in and, in and of uh, itself as well. There is a lack of research and literature available on the question of gender-based forms of violence against refugees after their arrival in France, which is indicative of the dominant political discourses on gender and migration, which tend to reinforce the othering of migrant and refugee women, as Jane pointed out as well. And this failure to consider gender-based violence and the needs of refugee women uh, after arrival uh, in France also helps explaining the lack of services and facilities which uh, are available uh, to them. One of the only previous studies on migrant women's experiences of gender-based forms of violence after arrival in France showed that women who had fled their country because of violence they experienced there were also statistically more likely to experience sexual and gender-based forms of violence after uh, their arrival. And this confirms the idea of a continuum of violence based not only on the fact of a geographical continuation of violence at all stages of a migration uh, journey, but also uh, of a casual link between having experienced violence in a country of origin and being more uh, vulnerable to violence, to violence after arrival. And our research shows that the reasons for this continuum can be found in the reception conditions, which create and reinforce situations of risk uh, for this woman. A major issue is the lack of places in accommodation structures for asylum seekers in France, even for those asylum seekers who do manage to register formally and make a claim because uh, this is already something that uh, is an achievement as there are many uh, administrative uh, barriers to actually register an asylum, an asylum claim. France received around 138,000 first-time asylum applications in 2019 and uh, around 81,000 in 2020, so this figure is lower because of the uh, COVID context. But on, only about half of these asylum applicants were able to access some kind of official accommodation. La CIMAD, which is one of the main NGOs working with asylum seekers uh, and refugee, uh, stated in its annual report that only two-fifths of asylum seekers get a place in any kind of accommodation center. So this means that around 70,000 people uh, were trying to find accommodations for about seven euros a day, which uh, they are officially allocated when they receive financial help, which is not the case for everyone. Uh, another 30,000 people had no accommodations and received no financial benefits at all. During our study, we found that even pregnant women and asylum, uh, pregnant women asylum seekers or women with young children had experienced homelessness and, and had slept on the streets for varied periods of time. This included women who were waiting for an appointment to register to seek asylum, as well as those already registered as asylum seekers and waiting for a decision. Mariam, for instance, who fled from Côte d'Ivoire at the age of 17 to avoid a forced marriage, which her stepfather was trying to uh, impose on her, recounted that she was about six months pregnant by the time she arrived in France, but that because of a lack of accommodation, she was forced to sleep rough on the streets of Paris. She eventually got help and accommodation from an NGO working with asylum seekers after she had visited a, a hospital. And I will come back uh, to this point, to the role of medical services for, uh, for this woman. C 
Sita, uh, who left Côte d'Ivoire with her young daughter to protect her from female genital mutilation, FGM, even though she was accompanied by her four-year-old daughter, she found herself in the streets with her daughter going hungry. After several days, the crying child drew the attention of a man who helped them out by accompanying them to an NGO that provided them with a bed uh, for a few days in a sports facility and ar arranged uh, after that for uh, emergency accommodation. Women who are forced to sleep in the streets also get no financial support or help from the French uh, authorities and first they have no means to buy food or other basic necessities, so many have uh, had to resort to begging to survive. When Aisata, a 26 year old from uh, Mali, arrived in Paris after months of hiding from her father, as her family would not accept uh, her for being a lesbian, she did not have anywhere to go and could not get a place in an accommodation center. So she found herself living in the street and she recounted, I didn't know where to go. I slept in the metro station. I called uh, 115, which is the emergency uh, phone number to find an emergency night shelter. But I couldn't afford to pay for transport. So to reach that night uh, shelter, it wasn't easy to get around, no papers, I managed to eat once a day. So this story is an example of extreme poverty faced by uh, women asylum seekers without access to any form of income. And it also testifies to the inadequacy of the system for providing emergency accommodation. For those who cannot even afford the metro fares, this is a very significant barrier to accessing uh, accommodation. Aisata found herself very, very isolated. She did not know anyone else in Paris and was completely alone in the streets. So she sought out discreet spots to sleep where she could be slightly more hidden uh, and protected from, from the omnipresent violence uh, of the streets. But she still felt in permanent danger, danger and she explained uh, that she uh, tried to find places to sit where she could pretend that she was waiting for someone, for example, in a train station, so that she was not, so that she wouldn't be perceived as someone who uh, was living in the street, because this would heighten the risk of physical aggression or sexual violence. And because of these conditions, she was not able to sleep, uh, but could only sleep for very, very short periods and she felt tired and ill all the time. So the lack of accommodation for asylum seekers in France can be interpreted as part of a more deliberate strategy of neglect which has been put in place to create a hostile and dissuasive climate for asylum seekers. The various uh, dispositives put in place by the French state to provide more accommodation uh, for asylum seekers can be viewed as uh, purely declarative if we take into account the reality of their implementation, which comes up in practice against a constant uh, saturation of national housing schemes for asylum seekers, uh, to quote Basile Engels and Slama. This planned neglect has gendered impacts in that it exposes women to sexual and gender-based forms of uh, violence after their arrival in France, and this creates a barrier as well to their accessing healthcare, uh, such as adequate ante and postnatal uh, care. So this is the structural dimension of this neglect that we really wanted to foreground uh, based on our on our uh, findings. And the last uh, point, if I still have uh, uh, one or two minutes that I would like to uh, highlight very much is the crucial role that medical services play in this context of social abandonment, because uh, emergency services are often the entry point for this woman to access some kind of basic, basic uh, services. So in this uh, context, um, healthcare centers have become a resource of last resort for shelter on the one hand and a getaway to other forms of support for women living on the street on the other. Faced with uh, the crucial lack of accommodation uh, places and the frequent absence of response from this emergency phone line that I mentioned, several NGOs uh, recount that hospitals and in particular maternity wards are forced to play the role of last resort shelter for pregnant women or women who have recently given birth. In the view of the risk of sexual violence in uh, street situations, an NGO had to advise some women to go to hospital waiting rooms, for example. They said, having to tell women to go 
go and rest in hospital waiting rooms is not something to be proud of. But at least there is a security guard. She won't rest very well, but at least her physical integrity uh, is protected. So in this context of social abandonment of asylum seeking women, health, healthcare workers are called upon to play the role of social workers uh, as well. Um, and I guess, I guess that my time is up, so I will stop here, but I'll be happy to answer any questions that you have. Thank you very much, Nina. And it was fascinating really to, to see that the similarities and differences in the two country contexts and shows the importance of this kind of uh, multi-country work. So we have about uh, 12 minutes left. Um, so I would invite members of the audience to please include questions into the chat and we can put these then to our speakers. Um, just to start off the discussions, I have two questions that are open both to Nina Nazarin and to, to Jane as well, of course. So the, the first one is to some extent methodological. So it's been wonderful to see the use of intersectionality as a way of interrogating the experiences of migrant women. Um, and I can see how the domains have been used as a, as a means of organizing data and so forth to do this. I wonder though, if you might tell us a little bit more in terms of the conceptual modeling between the different domains and to what extent these can actually be brought to bear to uh, better understand, I suppose, the life experiences in relation to uh, violence for women who are migrating or have migrated. The second question, and I'll just pose the two at the same time and, and then you can, can answer them, is uh, I was very struck by some of the quotes that you demonstrated, Nazrin. And uh, you know, some of them um, seem to reference the fact that where there have been acts of violence, there may be a reticence in actually reporting because of the desire to protect um, fellow members of a community. And you know, perhaps you know, this is even of a greater concern in the broader context of this kind of social abandonment that, that Nina, that you mentioned, in which the, the migrant community itself may be an important source of support and care and so forth across a broad range of different areas. So I wonder if there, you know, from your research, you know, to what extent can you talk about the ways in which the, um, the help seeking itself of women experiencing violence may be impacted by fears and resistance towards the, the country um, in which they find themselves and the fear of loss of um, asylum seeking opportunities and so forth from other members of the group. So I, I'll open that to whoever would like to, to go ahead now to answer those questions. Yeah, I can go first maybe. Is it okay? Sure. Yeah. Um, so the first thing um, that is, Stacey, uh, you're, we are actually, um, me and me were working with the term um, concept that uh, Mira Wilbal Davis uh, proposed, situating intersectionality with this whole macro domain. But that's kind of, uh, kind of I think, overarching um, frame. And that's the reason why we try to develop the three micro levels um, um, faces uh, that actually to reach uh, decisions that the women make and they are the, 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 the parts of resilience they have been taken. So uh, that's where all the experiences kind of interlinked. And I think you, you, we, we're still developing that frame uh, and to put our data on, uh, onto that um, analytical, uh, you know, uh, frame as well. But then uh, it actually connected with your second question because when you look at that, the decision making process of uh, whether to report of uh, gender based violence or not, there's so many other factors really influence the decision because the belonging, the way um, uh, the, uh, the, the, that could quote is from um, actually mentioned from a, uh, uh, the woman who was living in direct provision center. And she was saying that um, the reason, because within the diet provision center, there is a sense of belonging within the center because they are really alienated from Irish society. And they are alienated and they are often, um, uh, it, 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 it is often make it clear that they are not welcomed. They are not very, um, they're not very wanted. And that is the reason why 
within themselves, they feel a sense of belonging that they don't, even though they are harmed by their fellow migrant, they really don't want to uh, deport, uh, like, you know, uh, report them in fear, fear that they might be reported, their application might be rejected. So it's a kind of have a, uh, the migration uh, uh, insecurity, vulnerability, and um, so she's basically like for, for, her, for her husband or something like they are close, they don't want to deport because that might create some other forms of vulnerability. So is, these are very much intersecting and they are all there. And that is, the, the those are the th things is, is really open up all the quotations that not only that, there are so many things, other factors, especially fear. Fear is a overwhelming uh, determinant factor for uh, most of the um, women I we interviewed is that they have, they have fear of that people will not judge people will judge they would they have fear that um that they will be deported that's fear of deportation is huge and like one of one of my uh, participants she was uh she has an Irish she has an Irish passport and she has a stamp for but she constant uh having fear that uh, because her husband was saying uh actually put that fear in her mind that um that she feels that she cheated that system somehow I wasn't sure how she was cheated, but her husband emphasized that you cheated that migration process. So if I say that uh, you are my wife from the beginning, then you will be deported. Although she has a I, um, um, stamp for on behalf of her uh, children, she's, she's really scared about it, about to do anything about it. So there are so many fear around uh, actually dis became kind of deciding factors of uh, how they will um, proceed, uh, how they, they, whether they will report or not, whether they will um, uh, talk about it or not, or whether they will get services uh, from the service provider or not. So these are very, um, uh, very important factors. And that, that is the reason why we, we're trying to, um, trying to, see through the micro level, if that makes sense. Thank you, Nazim. Nina, did you want to come in on that at all? Uh, sure, uh, and uh, maybe Jen would like uh, as well, I'll just say very briefly to these two questions. Um, I, I, yeah, I believe that the, the intersectionality frame is really, really decisive and 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 very, very important. Uh, this is also the frame that we are working with. I didn't go uh, into that uh, in my presentation, but uh, I, I think that one of the uh, biggest contribution is for us to be able to think uh, about the intersection of uh, racism uh, and uh, gender discrimination. And because of what Jen has uh, foregrounded at the very beginning about how this issue is framed in media and political discourse, and also in some legal understanding about this other focus on uh, uh, FGM and forced marriage, which is of course very important, but given this kind of unique focus on these issues, we found that uh, through our research, it was also very important important to form ground that actually because of the lack of social policies, um, we observe a massive production of gender-based violence and sexual violence against refugee women. This structural lack of accommodations puts women every day on the street, on the streets at risk. And this is something that's happening structurally. It's not a few women, it's many of them. And, and this is a pattern that is repeated. So that's why we really want to uh, foreground that there is the structural production of gender-based uh, and sexual uh, violence. Uh, and intersectionality is, is, is a very useful framework for this. Uh, and to your second uh, question, um, I, maybe that that uh, yeah that that referred mostly uh, to Nasrin's presentation, but very uh, very briefly around this fear of reporting uh, for uh, for the woman, uh, something that uh, also came out uh, in in the interviews is. Um, because precisely of this intersecting experiences of this woman, there, there has been also so much institutional violence that they went through at the hands of administration that actually going to report to the administration or to the police can also be very difficult. So th this is uh, this is also uh, something um, 
that we we wanted to to highlight so this specific context of what they have already been through uh, with the administration uh, before and the police and this fear that uh, uh, Nasrin has also uh, highlighted. Great, thank you very much. And we have a few questions coming in from uh, from the floor. So uh, Sharon asks. It would be interesting to also learn about the people who are committing violence against the refugee migrant women in both the Irish and the French context. Who are these women at risk of experiencing violence from? Who are the people most likely to exploit the vulnerable situation of these women, whether it be due to their legal status, uh, financial status, et cetera? So that uh, Nina or Nazrin, would you like to comment on, on that question? And go first if you want. Uh, please go first, Nasrin. I, the question was okay. to pass from you. I need to okay. read. No problem. So, yeah, in my experience with all the participants I have, it's actually the uh, the the violent uh, the the people who are committing violence. It's uh, it's everyone. Uh, everyone I means that it's not limited to a certain group. Like uh, many of them are uh, many of the um, uh, stories are from intimate partner violence, but there are also stories of domestic violence from um, violence from other other members of the um, domestic uh, sphere, uh, members of the uh, of the and the, the intimate partners can be Irish, can be their community both. So there are examples from both, um, uh, and then they have also experience of sexual objectification, they have experience of, um, uh, you know, exoticization, sexual exoticization and uh, sexual harassment for common people, like, you know, people around there. So it's kind of, it's, 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 a, it's the vulnerability they are facing that's also uh, facing because of their migrant, their, their refugee status, a, a, People, uh, many of mine from uh, participants express that um, people try to take advantage of their situation. So uh, that's also um, these are also. I mean, I mean, there is no fixed thing that uh, the most women are uh, having violence from the uh, their husbands, but it's it's, it's bad. It's uh, from the system, from from the from the direct provision center. They they have a huge experience of violence from the managers of DP centers and from the um, their co community people. Yeah, and I think that I, I answered the questions. Great, thank you, Nazan. Jane or Nina, would you come in? Yeah, perhaps. I don't know if you wanted to say something, but I wanted to. I think this question is interesting, and it comes back really to what Nina and Nazrin have been saying about the way that violence isn't just about individual. We're not talking about individual acts. We're talking about a continuum where violence can be expressed through an individual act of intimate partner violence or domestic violence, but it's more than that, it's a whole structure and a system. So the people who are perpetuating the violence is the state through this, what we can call violent inaction or violence of neglect, as Nina said, providing, failing to provide homes, uh, people sleeping on the street, the, the violence of the direct provision system. We see the violence also at the borders where uh, women uh, are, pushed back at borders where their asylum claims aren't heard because of the asylum system or where their asylum claims are refused because the violence, the forms of persecution that they have experienced aren't recognized. So all of these are forms, um, form a, a continuum of violence, which, and so it's not so much about individual perpetrators, it's about a system which renders women um, vulnerable and puts them in situations of precariousness um, where they experience multiple forms of violence and when they don't have recourse um, to any support or any legal redress when they have experienced violence. So I think that's one of the, the, the strong findings of the research. Sorry, I don't know. I came in before you, Nina. I don't know if you want to add anything. Yes, exactly. And, and um, just maybe to provide one example, um, this creates configurations in which, uh, of course, uh, uh, 
uh, some people can take advantage of the situation. So what came out a lot also in interviews with, uh, with NGOs was that many of the women would uh, have to seek some kind of precarious, precarious arrangements to uh, basically have a roof uh, over their heads. Uh, and uh, this could very often be uh, in relation to transactional uh, sex, uh, so also situations of exploitation, um, and 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 this this type like the the fact that many of this woman of this woman were confronted with this type of situations was uh, obviously created by this overall uh, lack of uh, of accommodation uh, of accommodation places pushing kind of uh, women into this uh, very problematic uh, situations, and this is completely concealed, yes, with this, uh, with the cultural, culturalist uh, understandings of, uh, of GBV. So this is what we also wanted to, to highlight. Great, thank you very much. So we are now running slightly over time, but we do have two questions um, in our chat. Uh, so we might just see if you, if you can respond to them very quickly. Um, and then I'm going to invite Nata uh, back to say a few words to close the event. So we have a question from Nata herself um, directed towards Nazrin. And she's asking within the Irish study whether you saw any tropes of resilience in women's stories of uh, women's stories of resilience um, and notes that one of our doctoral students, Carol Ballantyne, identified the strong black woman trope, um, which has also been highlighted in US racial identity literature. Yeah, yeah I think and I, and I, and I, and I, I completely agree with you. There is, a, there is a risk of focusing too much on resilience. And so we are aware of that. Are, uh, and there is a, all this idea that uh, women are very powerful to, they, to overcome all. And that's not only for, only for the black women, where that is also very strongly already stereotype idea there, the strong black women. But also for, yeah, we can see this trope with many other types of even feminist um, discourse that women are very strong, they can overcome everything. They, so it's a kind of, uh, oh, Kind of putting all the responsibility to uh, to uh, overcome violence by by that for the individual women. So we want to always focus us on most of the time to the structural, the way this it, it has been structured and the way violence is produced uh, through structure, symbolic violence, structural violence, and gender-based violence, and all of them. But at the same time, we try we don't want to infantilize them as a passive victim that they, that they can't do anything. So it's like we 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 saw that they, how much they are they are damaged by the whole not they're damaged they're harmed by the system, but still they are trying to. I mean, they're not like you have to pick them up to do everything for them. If you give them some support, like they can they can actually try to overcome. So that's the, 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 that's the strength is really, uh, I think a positive uh, feeling that left after all of this violence. Yeah, great, thank you, Nasrin. So our last question comes from Rodney. Um, so he asks in relation to cultural challenges uh, experienced by us women asylum seekers, um, are there diplomatic discussions between states that are involved in these migrations to deal specifically with the root cause of migration? So he references things such as female genital mutilation or forced marriages um, and notes that his thinking is that this issue will persist until countries that the asylum seekers come from have policy reforms. So I believe that is to anyone who would like to engage with that question. Um, I think it's a, an interesting question. I think um, clearly there's a huge amount of uh, action at international level on these issues of FGM and forced marriage, like the UN, UN Women have lots of programs. But one thing we noticed and what, uh, what we were, we've noticed in analyzing national policies is the way that a focus on these questions as questions of what happens to other women, what happens to foreign women, what happens to these, you know, women in other civilized, you know, less, uh, what, what, what is, are represented as less advanced or less equal societies. Um, that is used just to deflect attention away from the failings of the, the French state or the Irish state um, in, you know, in the way that they offer protection or the way they offer reception to, to women coming to seek asylum. And something that was quite illustrative 
of this is um, in our French research, we wrote a letter to the Minister for Women's Rights to ask if we could uh, have an interview to talk about our research. And she replied saying, no, I'm sorry, I don't have time, but I'd like to tell you about all the development aid that France is giving for women's rights in other countries. So I think this is fairly typical to try and, you know, deflect this onto, you know, these other countries have problems, other countries don't respect women's rights, other cultures, and to not examine the very real issues um, which are happening you know, here in France or which are happening in Ireland or are happening in all of the other countries that we studied. So I think that that's really um, uh, the problem here, uh, according to our, not to say that FGM and forced marriage don't exist. So of course, they are forms of violence and they do exist, but I just think the way that they utilized um, in political discourse and rhetoric is something which, um, which needs to be questioned. So I don't know if any of the others want to say, add anything there. Well, I think we're, we're now about eight minutes over. So we might um, pass back over to Nata now just to close up the event. And I just wanted to note for everybody that there is a link that has been placed into the chat where you can get more information about this research project. So Nata, if you would like to um, say a few words. Yes. Thank you so much. First, I want to get, uh, really express my deep gratitude and thanks for making the presentations that you've done um, from your research, because this is a very important topic, that there is this structural violence that has to be addressed if we're going to talk about ensuring that there some sort of real equality for all asylum seekers, irrespective of their ethnicity or gender, because some of the structural violence also affects men uh, equally. And two, that it highlights how important it is to address the hostile environment of migration. And that what it, it particularly in today's context where we're seeing the dig uh, the kind of human solidarity that is being shown to Ukrainians that makes us all feel good and it's important to feel good about our ability to show and express solidarity but also that we must not give up on this fight to actually address the significant lacuna in migration policy in this developed West. And so I think it's been really fascinating and thank you so much. We look forward to the completion of the research, particularly the micro stories that you said, the micro factors and the re recommendations that will emerge. And I'm sure they will be extremely useful for all of us who are interested in ensuring that refugee status, asylum seeking, is a journey that is painful in itself and should not be obstructed and halted by these kinds of state enforced violence. So thank you so much. And there is a recording of this session so that uh, Gillian uh, will, I'm sure, circulate the link. So thank you everyone. Thank you.